I'd like to introduce our host and psychotherapist for the series, I Am Not Okay, Kim Christing. Kim is the founder and executive director of Bay Ridge Counseling Centers and Human Strong, which is part of the Bay Ridge Circle of Care. He is an author and creator of several mental health programs in the area of mood disorder and anger management. For several years, Kim hosted a call-in national talk show called Nightlight and has appeared on numerous national talk shows speaking to the issues of mental health and relationships. Over his 40-year career, Kim has intimately worked with thousands of individuals, couples, and families to help navigate the challenges of mental, emotional, and relational health. Please welcome Kim Christie. Well, our guest today is Ashley Stahl. Ashley is a counterterrorism professional turned career coach and author of the book U Turn Get Unstuck, Discover Your Direction, Design Your Dream Career. And Ashley's been on a mission to help you step into a career you're excited about and align with it. Through her two viral TEDx talks, her online courses, her email lists of over 500,000, and her show, The U Turn Podcast, she's been able to support clients in over 78 countries in discovering their best career path, upgrading their confidence, and landing more job offers. She maintains a monthly career column in Forbes, and her work has been also featured in outlets such as The Wall Street Journal, CBS, Self, Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and more. Well, welcome, Ashley. Uh, today's theme is uh, part two on respect, and uh, uh, we want to we want to be jumping into a dialogue today with how do people deal and cope differently with power and influence in the workplace. And so, Ashley, uh, as probably a kind of a way of of, of just kind of letting the, the listener understand some of your, your background. Uh, can you talk a bit about your work in counterterrorism? Yeah, um, I grew up in a house where the news was always on. And from a really young age, I was really interested in what was going on in the world. And it was natural for me to go to college, study politics. And I was really impacted by 9-11. So I ended up learning foreign languages, Arabic, French, and uh, making my way into the Pentagon as a defense contractor in 2010, working on a program that was intended to prevent Afghanistan from going into the unrest that it's currently in. And, um, you know, during that time, I realized that I was far too sensitive for national security and that that wasn't the right career for me. And on the side, I was helping people land job offers. I was helping people rework their resume because I was so committed to my job hunt as a millennial coming out of the recession that I got some incredible job hunting skills and was helping every friend I knew land job offers. And that eventually turned into a business. Wow. Wow. And, and so you describe yourself as being a little too sensitive, but obviously you are highly gifted and skilled and, and probably driven to even get to that place. Uh, and did you experience it to be a mainly a male dominated organization? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the inspirations that brought me to wanting to be a career coach eventually. And obviously, in my early 20s, I was like, you know, what career do I have to coach off of? So I just helped people with job hunting. I started with what I knew. And obviously, now a decade later, I have a book and a podcast and all those things, courses, all that kind of stuff. But um, at the time, I just worked with what I knew. And um and, and followed it. And so career coaching was kind of that next step for me that had inspiration. Can you, can you uh, talk a little bit about um, um, how do women or non-binary people get respect in today's diverse workplace? I mean, you worked in a male-dominated, so what was that like and uh, what do you find your clients experience? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is to know the distinction between being respected and being liked. And I think a lot of that comes from having a personal self versus a professional self. Um, and I learned that concept from Steve Chandler, who's an incredible coach. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is remembering that when you come into the workplace, you really weren't given an opportunity in life to decide who you want to be professionally. 
um, we kind of are told who to be personally as kids. We're told what it looks like to be good, what it looks like to be bad. And we're conditioned, we're domesticated very much so like, like an animal is. Um, we're taught what it looks like to, to show up in society and what it looks like to not be showing up appropriately in society. And so for that reason, I think we come into the workplace with this emotional backpack on us of wanting to be liked. And we haven't thought enough about how important it is not only to be liked, but to be respected. And being respected in the, in the workspace comes from having a sense of professional self. So I always encourage people to say, who do you want to be professionally? And can you look at people that have inspired you professionally so that you can learn from them and create results based on what you're seeing them, you know, them do? Can, a wonderful point to making that distinction. Can I ask you, what do you think? Can you have... Uh, a professional and have a sense of respected professional self, but not respect yourself personally. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people abandon themselves through their work. Work is just like many other addictions, where people use it to hide from who they are, or what they want, or what they're not getting. Um, I think work is success is one of the warmest places you can go to hide, and I think uh, a lot of people will hide behind achievement and. Really, when they look at themselves in the mirror, they're missing something really important in their lives and they're using their career as a way to run away from the feelings that they feel from not having that thing. And instead of working on their marriage or their friendships or their family life, they throw themselves into work. So I think it's really important to notice any sort of addictive habits when it comes to your career. That's, that's a difficult uh, thing to examine. I've often yeah. said that I come from a long, long history of workaholics in the sense of, uh, you know, they were farmers, they were business owners, they were medical people, they, and they, uh, they work hard and it was rewarded. It was rewarded to work hard. So uh, to have, uh, you know, I think our, our work rewards us if we're workaholics. So it's difficult to even see that we might have yeah. that tendency. Do you, yeah. yeah do, you absolutely. Tend to be like, do you tend to be no, like that? I have, I have a lot of balance in my life. Um, I have a lot of, and I think that the reason I'm happy in my career is because I have a lot of boundaries in it. Um, I know what's a yes. I know what's a no. I know what I can do. And um, I was recently diagnosed with Lyme disease. I got a tick bite, um, I think years ago, but more recently discovered it. And I don't really have that many symptoms, but what it has taught me is to be pretty uh, ruthless with your boundaries. And it doesn't mean you have to be unkind. I think boundaries are the key to, there's a big difference between boundaries and barriers. You know, sometimes people feel like they haven't taken care of themselves and they put up barriers and it's like this wall between them and the world. Whereas a boundary is much kinder. It's a much kinder and clearer way of saying this is where I can go and this is where I can't go um, and, and not taking responsibility for people who maybe don't understand or don't um, want to support it um, and just keeping that loyalty to yourself. And so for me, I'm not a workaholic. I, I definitely have a lot of responsibility on my shoulders quite often, but it I always schedule myself a lot of downtime to take care of myself. It's it's very rare that I push through and I and I don't take care. I like that. I like that a lot, and I hope that uh, others can 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 learn learn those lessons. Although it's you, it is probably that journey that we all experience that we learn in our own lives. Can I can I shift a gear uh, when we talk about uh, workplace and and the challenge of diversity and. Uh, respect. Um, can I ask you as a person, have you ever experienced discrimination or harassment in the workplace? Yeah. I mean, I think that um, being a woman in a male dominated space, you know, it's not unusual for you to, you know, get hit on or something like that. But I always just try to make sure I take responsibility for myself and keep my communication professional. Um, I think that you know, in a lot of ways, we co-create the energy that we receive and people people can pick up on um, loose energy or um, energy where you are receptive to someone taking advantage of you. And that's not always the case. People will take advantage of people. 
But I think it's really important to take stock of how you are showing up energetically in a room. Um, what are you, what vibe are you putting off? So um, when I walk into a room, I want to be respected. I want to be taken seriously. And um, I'm not very loose about that. And so I think that has really been a reason why I've had some pretty strong success in such an intense work environment. Well, I like I like the use of the word energy. Um, yeah. So, so I, I and and energy uh, can be, I guess, somewhat equi- uh, compared to power. So, do you think that the more beautiful or handsome you are in a defined, as defined by culture, the more energy or power and influence you have in the workplace? The the research doesn't lie. So um, there is research that substantiates that being more attractive. And according to other research, that means having a more symmetrical face amongst some other things. We're also attracted to people who look like our family in some way, like we're attracted to ourselves um, in a way. But there is research that shows that being conventionally attractive does help your odds. Um, But I think that there's a lot more to that puzzle. I mean, right now we're seeing a lot of research come out that leaning into remote work can mean that you're leaning out of your career. And I completely understand that because you cannot replace in-person connection. Most language is nonverbal. And when you reduce your communication in the workspace to email or to phone calls or even to Zoom, you're missing some element that is really important of human language and interaction. And I think that's why the research is indicating that people who are going to be in the office are going to get gains in their career and get more likely to be promoted. Um, And so while I'm a huge proponent for working remotely and taking care of yourself and having the boundaries that you need, um, I'm also a realist when it comes to acknowledging data and research and then, and then being the exception and not the rule. Hmm. Very interesting points. And so, so um, we all know the economic law of supply and demand. And when it comes to uh, demand, it would appear that us as humans cannot get enough sex. The need is seems to be always there. Our world is obsessed with it. Matter of fact, the business world sells their products based on sexuality, millions of products every single day. How do you see sexuality bleeding into work relationships and in work environments? Mm, I have to think about that one. Um, I don't think as much about sexuality as I do masculine and feminine energy. Um, But when it comes to sexuality, I would say that there's different fields of thought So you have the field of thought where if you're a woman, there's a gift in that and use it to your advantage. Um, Use that, your beauty, use whatever you have. Um, There's another field of thought that that's not what you need to be taken seriously and that um, a strong mind will stand on its own. Good ideas, elegant ideas will stand on their own. Um, So I would say, you know, if I've worked with someone who, and I have had clients where they get sexual advances from a boss or a manager, um, I've taught them the importance of being a broken record. So it's not like you have to expand on the topic. You can easily say something like, I'd love to keep our communication and dynamic more professional. And if the person keeps pushing, just repeat it. I'd love to create our dynamics and communication in a more professional tone, you know, just really repeating yourself Um, because the thing is people get bored when you are clear and straightforward and they're going to pick on someone else. And that is something that I learned working in national security. Hmm. Hmm. It sounds like, uh, 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 what we do with, uh, what I, I coach with parents with, uh, with two-year-olds that keep asking, why can't I do this? Why can't I do this? And you just repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, yeah. Um, and so, um, and so, how? I mean, whenever we talk about uh, affairs, we talk about the sexual aspects of uh, uh, relationships. A huge amount happen at work, and yeah. and so, um, and so, while you you talk about you know your your feminine or male or whatever your energy, we 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 have to consider that we're all sexual 
and and there are, are certain needs there. And so, um, do you think that uh, that people are aware of the power or influence they have by the way they look, where they're pretty, or as you said, you know, the the research would show that most uh, top executives are over six feet tall as men or whatever. And so our physical uh, appearance, et cetera, goes a long way to uh, even uh, influence our hardwired sexuality. And, Mm -hmm. and are we, yeah, are we to use that? Are we unethical or are we res- even respectful or discriminatory when we use our, our um, the way we look for advancements? I'm a proponent of looking professional all, at all times. And to me, that means really taking note of the culture that you're working in and dressing in alignment with that. Um, as far as using your beauty, um, I think that if you have beauty, you have beauty, but not seeing it as a tool, but rather seeing your mind as your biggest asset and your tool. Um, because ultimately, t- um, success makes noise. And someone who has a bright mind and good ideas and good execution, um, they're going to be noticed no matter what, because people need talent in today's world. Um, as far as, you know, being sexual beings, um, you know, I had a guest on my podcast named John Wineland and he talked about sexual chemistry and my show is called the U-Turn podcast. And it was the most downloaded episode that we have. And he argues that um, the reason that men lose sexual interest in their partner is because they feel a lack of devotion. And this is obviously very gender normative the way that I'm speaking, but, um, and he says the reason that, women lose interest in sexual connection with their partners. They don't trust them in some way. And that's why you often see the CEO that that trite story of the executive cheating with the secretary or because there's a level of devotional energy that he may be receiving from that. Um, So as far as my own opinion as a career expert on sexuality, it's it's not my realm. It's, It's not something that I have expertise with around, you know, sexual energy, but I have collected a lot of insight and I do really find uh, what John Wineland says to be interesting and something to consider. Um, But as a career person, I'm always going to be an advocate for people leading with their mind, their ideas, their results, and not with how they look. Because ultimately, no matter how beautiful you are, you're not going to be earning a paycheck at a certain point if you're not creating results. People put a price on a job because they need a result for that price. I love that. I like that. And um, can I ask you then, um, are we, do in our workplace, you know, there's a lot of conversations about discrimination. Um, do we discriminate against people who have uh, personalities that are more passive? Yeah, I do think the workforce is built in a way where um, it supports extroverts more than it does introverts. And I think it's really important for managers to understand that with nearly half of the you know population being divided, introverts, extroverts, it's managers' responsibility to make it a safe space to also collect insight and um and knowledge from their introverted counterparts on their team and colleagues. And so um, knowing that the workplace does favor that extroverted nature where you're more social and you're more communicative and you have more contacts and more friends because you're more chatty, it's important to know who's an introvert on your team and be able to say, hey, Ashley, do you have any ideas? I haven't heard from you. I would love to hear what you're thinking about this. Um, I think that that's simply good management and good leaders are there to pull out the best from their team and it's their responsibility to notice um, how to cater to each individual in that way. And, and, and so I, I, I like that a lot, especially in terms of uh, pulling out the gifts of, of, of each person, whether it's an introvert or an extrovert or they're, they're assertive or not. And um, cause they bring something to the table and, and we uh, need the right people in the boat as it were in, in the right positions. However, is it ethically wrong to create a culture that you prefer? Tell in me other more. words, you might, 
In other words, with the passivity or the introvert, you might, as a manager or a, a boss, uh, prefer um, prefer a, a certain temperament, as it were, like an extrovert or, or in that sense. Well, some jobs might require different strengths, um, but I think that it's important for leaders to remember that people don't work for you, you work for them. That real leadership is about you making your team shine, making other people shine, and that reflects back at you anyway. Um, So yes, I think certain jobs are going to thrive with an extrovert, and I think that the introverts of the world are not going to want those jobs. They don't want a job that's going to force them to have to be peopling, you know, it's, it's not really a word, but I love that word, all day. Um, And so I would say, um, understanding the strengths of both sides, there is a value in um, the ability that an introvert has to pay attention and listen. Um, Extroverts may tend to communicate before they fully collected information, sometimes not the case, it's just a possibility. So I would say, um, yes, you want to fill roles and create a culture based on what you want. But remember that as a leader, you work for other people, they don't work for you. Good said. Well said. Um, and Ashley, um, you, you mentioned feeling safe in the environment. Do you think everyone has a right to feel safe at work? I think everyone has the right to feel safe, but I think a lot of the time safety is an inside job and it's your own mental um, capacity or your own experiences or traumas that make you feel a sense of safety in the world or not. Um, a lot of safety has to do with feeling like you're judged and some people make them make it okay for others to judge them or don't care as much about what other people think. And that kind of goes back to being liked versus being respected. Um, I think people who want to be respected, it comes down to really doing the job and doing it well. And the people that want to be liked, it, it comes down to not just doing the job, but what people think of you. Um, and it's not to say that Being respected and doing the job right means that you have to sacrifice being liked, but I think it's about knowing what you want to lead with and really showing up with that. I really, I really like that a lot um, um, because I think uh, there's a huge percentage of people who who uh, are pleasers or or are not do not have the internal boundaries as you had said to be able to separate respect and light, and um, and so. But I think there's be there would probably be an awful lot of uh, um, situations in the workplace where employees, employers struggle, where employees feel that they have a right to feel safe, and if they don't feel safe because they're uncomfortable with um, assertive people or very vocal people or opinionated people, um, that they might um, cry wolf. Yeah, I understand that, like not feeling safe to speak up. I think that's your own inner work is to make it safe for yourself to speak up, talk to HR. If you're seeing something unprofessional that is impacting your ability to deliver your work and um, is very much like a violation of your general security or safety, I think it's okay to say something and um, finding the right point of contact. And if you're in a culture that doesn't allow that, permit that, encourage that, then that's just feedback that you're not working in the right place for you. And what about the flip side of that coin? What if they're, they feel unsafe, but everyone else has been professional? But it doesn't change the fact that I often sometimes see you in the process, uh, Ashley, of, of moving someone who has been traumatized or hurt or not grown up with uh, a sense of healthy development, that even assertiveness feels like aggression to them. Yeah. If someone is a, it feels like aggression. And, and so they might call wolf in the sense of, I, I don't feel safe. They are abusing me or emotionally abusing me or uh, those kind of things. They aren't respecting me. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that that's your own work because that voice in your head is going to go with you to the next job and the next job and the next job. So I would say we all have our own responsibility to self-reflect, look in the mirror, really notice our shortcomings, collect feedback without being defensive about it, um, and consider doing our own work, whether it's with a therapist or a coach or even just a friend. And and how would you say the system or a boss or an employer or a manager would should deal with that situation? 
Uh, you know, right now, mental health and well-being is front and center with corporations, and I'm really happy to see that. So I would say the first thing is to know your resources. A lot of people don't read their employee handbook or take the time to even understand what's available to them, what's there to support them as people in the workforce. So I would say know what's there to support you through your employer. Like, do you get reimbursed for therapy? Does your health insurance cover some of it? Does it not? Um there's also websites that are making resources like therapy very affordable. So I would say just knowing what your resources are and not making it have to be this big, scary step, but making it something approachable. Um, I think I'm a big proponent for therapy. I think everybody could use it and not everybody's doing it. And um, I've been in therapy for like 13 years. And a lot of the time I have nothing to talk about. I just go because I think it's important for me to have a, a place that is just there for me, even if there's not much that I have to say. Wow. Well, I, uh, I think that is a refreshing uh, phrase. I, I have various clients in my own practice that that do that on a, on a regular basis for the same reason, just because they know they're in a high pressure job, they have high yeah. expectations and that it's just logical and rational that stress is going to affect, affect us. And, uh, and I hear constantly, uh, at, at the end of the session saying, you know, I came in here thinking I don't have anything to say. And here we are processing things that I didn't even know was uh, getting to be. So thanks. You know, that that's uh, I've, such a healthy thing to do to be able to honor and take care of your own inner sense. Um, can we talk a bit about um, uh, what somebody once uh, mentioned in terms of uh, Handing, handling difficult emotions within relationships. I, I was surprised. I worked with one, one person for a number of years, and, and she was a very competent lady. And I was surprised when she says, she said, I really don't like working with women because they tend to be too emotional. Mm. How can can he, and that's obviously pr very, uh, uh, just a general comment, but I mean, there can be men that can be uh, very emotional as well. What do you do whenever there's high sensitivity within the workplace of individuals? I would say, you know, when people say something like that, it says more about them than I think it does about the other person. So that person to me, the fact that she says she doesn't like to work with women, I think everybody is a mirror. And so if she reflects back on herself, what is it about her as a woman that isn't pleasant to work with? Is it that she's not emotionally available to people who, because part of leadership is making space for people's emotions um, and navigating those. Like, you know, sometimes we get so transactional in the workplace, we forget that people are human beings with feelings. And part of what leaders need to do is navigate those feelings. That is the crux of leadership is being able to provide feedback, being able to create that safety. So someone who doesn't like a gender because they think they're too emotional. I think that that's more about them and their own beliefs than it is about the gender itself. So that's an interesting uh, thought. And you said, so leadership is, and then you went on to say that, that it's, um, it's about giving a space for emotional sensitivity. Um, it wouldn't be too long ago that we would not define a uh, business leadership that way. And I, and I, it's kind of like being a teacher, I think, Ashley, uh, you know, years ago, it would be, you were required to, to uh, download information and uh, train them, etc. And now they feel like they're social workers, and they don't have the skills, etc. And so, I mean, uh, are we, have we changed the definition of what it means to be a manager and a CEO and all the rest of it, that you now need to have the skills of, of, a, of a psychotherapist or a psychologist or a social worker? And oh, my goodness, I have to be sensitive to people and all that. That seems to be a layer of expectation that has changed over the generations. I mean, if you want to get the best out of people, you need to bring the best of yourself. And I think you can't really help people um, or have empathy for people if you haven't done that work on yourself. You know, there's certain blind spots that we all have. And once we start to see those in ourselves, we start to have patience for them with other people. We don't expect perfection out of people. We don't expect people to be robots. 
Um, and so I wouldn't say that today's leaders need to have therapeutic skill sets, but I would say that they do need to have soft skills like patience, adaptability, um, and emotional intelligence. And um, I think it's important right now that leaders understand that we are in a time where more people are quitting their, their jobs than we've seen in two decades. And it's because not just because they want remote work or more pay, it's because they want meaning and they want to feel like a whole human in their job. And they want their, their company to feel like it's doing something in the world that matters to them. And the pandemic gave them a lot of time to reflect on that. And so while people are afraid to get COVID and they do want remote work, there's also this piece of being a whole human. And so I think companies need to really uh, pay attention to who they're hiring to lead their teams because 50% of people don't leave their job because they don't like their job. They leave because they don't like their boss. People are leaving bosses just as much as they're leaving jobs and companies can't afford that loss anymore. So in that sense, especially big corporations, then uh, they need to drill down and be able to understand that talent is going to leave if we don't have treat them with uh, respect and 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 have those soft skills, as you mentioned. Uh, I would dare say that the entire generation and parents and families and everyone and organizations, period, need to develop those soft skills and uh, uh and it's required. It's a complicated world, and and it's becoming more and more difficult. So I, I like I like that what you've said there. Um, can we? Can I talk a little bit about uh, something else that 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 someone's uh, made mention to me, and I thought that's interesting. And they they thought of actually probably your generation, uh, the millennials, and the generation of uh, that we are in. That change is happening so quickly, especially with technology, and, um, and that there seems to be less respect for the people in their 50s and 60s, and the youth are uh, not respecting the people with experience because they are out of touch with the latest technology or those kind of things. And how is that equitable in our workplaces? How... Do you, yeah, just comment on that. Any thoughts about yeah. that in your experience? None if, at all? If the doc, yeah, if the dot-com boom or the rise of technology taught us anything, it's that um, there's more to having value in the workplace than experience. Experience is valid. Wisdom is valid. It's important. But if you look at the average age of a technology CEO, we're looking at people in their 30s who are leading companies that are leaving a mark on the times that we are in like none other. You know, you see Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook just being the tip of the iceberg of the millennial generation coming into leadership um, and so many other CEOs that are young. And so I think what the millennial demographic is doing is it's undermining and challenging the, the belief amongst baby boomers and even Gen Xers that experience trumps all. And um, millennial generation is one that believes in the democracy of ideas. And um, this is a generation that's not afraid to go into the CEO's office and share what they're thinking. And the fact is that there is no superiority or inferiority here. There's just different. And what's different is that the baby boomer generation, Gen X, needed to get used to the rise of technology, whereas millennials grew up with it coming into their lives. They did know life without it for a moment. And now you have Gen Z who's going to massively dominate uh, the workforce by 2033. Um, and right now they have a big stronghold in the workforce already, just like millennials do. And it's going to increase, obviously. Um, they don't know a world without technology. So their expectations are that companies are technologically equipped and optimized. And so while there is a lot of wisdom in leadership and um, time that you've put into your career, I think there's a lot of um, intelligence and um, being nimble with technology that the younger generations have. And so I think over-focusing on experience or over-focusing on know-how, you're, you're missing, you, you need both. Um, you need the intellectual capability with technology and today's times just as much as you need wisdom and experience in working with people. And, and, uh, and so 
What do you do whenever people are let go in their 50s and 60s to prepare them for uh, being competitive? I would say it's never a bad time to just upskill, to, to take a look at where you're headed and ask yourself, what are the top skills that I need to stay relevant in these roles that I want to be in? Um, and to not be afraid to go online, take courses, uh, also networking, you know, conversations move your career forward unlike anything else. So um, start having conversations with people who are thriving, doing something that you really want to do and get really curious about, you know, what they're doing that they think is making it work for them. Um, I think the moment you lose curiosity, you lose momentum. I like that. Can you talk a bit more about that? You, when we lose curiosity, we lose momentum. That sounds yeah, like, has. well, oh, go ahead. it sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like constant creation. That's what nobody really tells you about your career, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're in the workforce, is that we are all so focused on starting and growing. We don't think enough about sustaining. And, um, the, the reality is the world is changing quickly. You know, there are some decades that have to go by for a week of progress to happen. And there are some weeks where decades of progress happen. And right now we are in a time where weeks have gone by and decades of progress have happened. And so it's kind of like you either sink or swim. You either choose to adapt, you choose to be curious, you choose to learn the new tools in front of you or you don't. And, and it's a personal choice. And I, and I totally get it. It is overwhelming, but you really just have to pick your poison. Do you want the overwhelm of not having momentum or do you want the overwhelm of having to learn, learn new information to stay relevant and continue your momentum? Well, that sounds like a lot of stress on the wheel for a lot of people. In other words, I've often yeah. said, uh, I'm sure you would, you would experience, and as you are in your probably your own giftings, is that uh, creative? Anything that's creative and, and moving and changing is is using the frontal lobe, and and uh, and the frontal lobe is all the the, the fresh thinking. And uh, um, but most of life, we like to use the anterior part of the brain, which is more the repetitive, the, the, the habits, the sustainability, et cetera, because it's less work. And so yeah. if we spend most of our time in the creative, in the curious, it is more stressful, it is more difficult. And so do we need to create more resilient uh, employees and people in the workforce today? I think we do. And I think um, it's fair for you to say that it sounds stressful to sustain. I think it's more stressful to avoid it. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that this comes back down to self-care. I think taking care of your, staying with the times doesn't have to mean that you're voraciously reading books on the weekends that you have off. It just means being receptive, being a receptive person with resilience and willingness to learn and ask questions. And, you know, I, I can't recall who said the quote, if you're not growing, you're dying. But um, the good news about all of this is that it makes you grow. And that's what we're ultimately here to do, I think, as human beings, is to connect and to grow. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the thoughts that I would no, have. I, I like it. I, no, I like it a lot, Ashley. And, and um, it seems to me, coming from a baby boomer generation, et cetera, it, and yet I'm in this industry of, of working with individuals, uh, you hear a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of challenges. And so it seems to me that as the generations go by and as we are required to um, take on new skills and, and grow longer and further, we used to, we used to be able to, not in my generation, but my parents' generation would be that I'm, you know, employee for life. And I, I'm going to just, be in one one uh, corporation and have a pension, etc. And now the changes are, are are happening so often, and so you use the word, and I love it. Uh, but our, my generation do not really understand that. Is about self care. We didn't have to do a lot of focus on self care as much, um, and so it seems to me. Would you agree that that 
as the generations go f- along, we're going to have to pay more attention to our own internal self, our internal world, our, inter- our relationships. We're going to have to focus and make sure and manage that a lot more uh, competently. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And I think that, um, you know, I interviewed Carter Cass, the former CEO of Walmart.com on my podcast, and he had shared that the number one influence on his success in business was knowing his shadow, knowing the parts of himself that he orphans and abandons. Um, And I think it's really important to know where you are not looking and having that level of self-awareness. And I think leaders of tomorrow need to have that kind of self-awareness, especially in a world where um, a, a large percentage of the workplace is being replaced by robots. Yeah, I agree. And generally speaking, how self-aware do you think people are in terms of when they come to you for your coaching? Usually somebody who comes to me has already started to look at their own awareness and they've gotten stuck somewhere um, or they just want to accelerate. Um, But I read some statistic that 85% of the population does not have self-awareness. And I'm not sure if that's accurate, but it feels accurate. I think most people are sleepwalking and I have no judgment on that. Um, I think a lot of people say that they're fine. And when you say you're fine, you're just not in touch with your pain. And um, I think that that's really just a common case right now for where we are. And that's why I think a lot of people are bringing their pain to work and projecting it onto their employees. I agree. I agree with you. And that's why our, uh, we've titled this, I'm not okay. And, and, uh, I think none of us are are perfect. So we're not okay in some area. And, uh, are we aware of that at least? And, uh, and so the goal is to become more conscious of who we are. Mm-hmm. And, and even more importantly, I think, and I like your emphasis is, and I think it's, it's true for positive psychology to be able to say, are you in any way understanding how wonderful you are and how mm-hmm. being able to, for people to say, do you, can you not see what you provide or what you uh, contribute to? The workplace or society, etc., and to tap into that um, and and expand on that, I think is 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 so critical, so critical. Yeah. Well, um, I I think workplace is is such an important. We spend most of our life in our workplace, and these relationships in these areas are allow for so many opportunities to grow. And so I, I think your work must be very, very rewarding. Thank you. It really is. I, um, I like to bring the mystical and the practical together. I think that there's value in both, you know, the mindset tools and different modalities that are ancient alongside tactical tools that work today. And um, mm. I'm really proud of people who take that under their wing and bring it into their career. And that's why I wrote my book. Nice. Well, uh, once again, I, I want to thank you for, for taking the time and certainly anyone listening for, for being able to uh, listen to the podcast or the, the books. And uh, uh, Ashley, thank you for, for joining us. I think you bring a very uh, important information that is not just about careers but it's about people and um, I think that's what uh, the most important thing is and I think most organizations would say that is in their their mission statements is that we as humans and people we want to make a difference and not only in the world but in within the culture that we create. And so uh, all the best in, in, in your work and continuing forward. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks for the conversation. Oh, you're welcome. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.